put those in the fridge and I'll start off. We're here uh, with Scott Jacobs. Now, Tom now, Jacobs. Tom Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> you know where that came from, Scott. <laughs> Uh, uh, we're here with Tom Jacobs, and uh, normally these wonderful pottery casts are with people I've known for my whole tenure here, but I just met you at the gallery, at the bookstore gallery, about a month ago, less? Yeah, I was trying to pick you up, but, you know, I'm a married guy. Well, it worked halfway, I'm here talking <laughs> to you, and we are... We Willis are, was around, you know. We're drinking coffees together. <laughs> and anyway, Tom told me that he runs this gallery... Is, no, 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 no. You no. said you, no. Hold on. Let me tell you what you said. You said that you write for the Motley Fool. Right. I'm a I'm an investment analyst. An investment analyst, and you said you had a gallery in town. Well, yes. I'm the honorary uh, part of Indy Jacobs. Uh, Villas is really the with the power there. Well, what? There's someone named uh, Villas. Is Villas is my wonderful partner of 13 years. Villas Indy. Okay. Well, right. I, like I said as we were prepping, I said that. Uh, I my, the, my sine qua non. I thought the guy who ran the place was named Indy Jacobs. No, 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 no. What's the no. story? Okay, tell, just give us the story of, um, of Indy Jacobs, why it's there. How old is it, first of all? Indy Jacobs opened in September 2005 in the, what was George's Garage, a building that had been a VW repair shop for years in Marfa and was closed. And we bought that from Bobby Donaldson. Should I know that name, Bobby? Well, locals certainly do. Bobby uh, owns and runs the ABC Pump, ABC Hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, has a long and great history in Marfa. Super guy in his 80s, and he still climbs uh, windmills and fixes the pumps on them. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we, we heard typical Marfa story. You know, We heard uh, from somebody who knew somebody who was related to Bobby that maybe he'd sell the property. And we were looking for a gallery property, uh, for a location to put a gallery on. And Highway 90, I mean, it was perfect. In 2005, that's before I came here, but I understand there was something of a housing boom and an art boom, and the Marfo was fighting its way up right next to Santa Fe. And so <laughs> yeah, well, that was glib. Okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, Santa Fe. Uh, well, I mean, think about the Santa Fe art scene and uh, here are all my friends in town, if I have any left after this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically what's happened in Santa Fe is, you know, uh, a lot of well-meaning white folks go to Santa Fe for Indian market every year and spend tens of thousands of dollars on a lot of really poor art. And uh, some of it's very good, but, you know, they, they think, oh, boy, you know. Indian art, and uh, so it's lost a lot of the diversity of art, and it's really become focused on on high end Indian art. Anyway, that's another thing. It's silly. No, no, that's the thing. I lived there for four years. Yeah. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's silly. First of all, what you refer to as white people, I call whitey or the white man. And, uh, <laughs> that's because, um, <laughs> And, killing me. and I, I left that town because I was a, obviously a younger man when I lived there, and the place was like quicksand to me. It was very easy to stay there entrenched in the, the misty clouds of folk. But I, I didn't think it had a thriving art scene. I thought, you know, well, I want to bring up two points, but this is your interview. But the first point is there is a difference between a thriving art scene that sells art and a thriving art scene that makes art. And generally, they don't go together. Generally, the thriving art scene that makes art sends their art someplace, and it is sold at a thriving art place that Absolutely. makes art. Absolutely. And Santa Fe hasn't been a thriving art place that makes art for a long, long time, in my estimation. Yeah, and lest I get a lot of nasty calls, the, the Indian art is more or less made in the state. Uh, but, you know, that covers a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad spectrum. I guess I just... What I... What I feel a lot is, you know, you need people to buy art, right? Yeah. And people who are going to buy art generally are going to have money. And as we know, there's no relationship, uh, cause and effect between money and taste. Mm -hmm. And one of the wonderful things about Marfa uh, is that because of the Judd and Flavin, monumental works, mm -hmm. you know, worldwide known, and other works, a lot of people who come here have a certain aesthetic and have a certain view of art. Now, 
it need not be the only one. It may not be right or wrong, mm-hmm. but it is. It does bring a certain level of sophistication, and you have working artists here, so it's a really nice mix. And art is sold and art is made. I, you're a tactful guy. You've demonstrated that already. So oh, come on. I'm, I've made ten enemies in the space of five minutes. So you don't need to respond to this fully, but <laughs> the, I, I came here with a friend uh, a few hours ago, and he didn't know you, but he observed, oh, Indy Jacobs, that's a, a serious gallery. <laughs> and I, I think what he was saying is not necessarily putting down other galleries, but simply... By saying, no means, by yeah, no means. What, what he was saying is that this is a gallery where you guys are trying to sell art, you're trying to put... How should I say this? You guys are hands-on in that gallery. Well, what... And I, again, I defer to Villas here, but, but it's sort of interesting, I would think, in the sense that I've learned a lot of what... I know about contemporary and modern art from Villas. I mean, I grew up as any sort of middle-class educated kid, right? I knew about the Impressionists and the Renaissance and things like that. Mm. Uh, but I learned... I, I, we, <laughs> we were in D.C. At, uh, one time for three years. This is my first time with The Motley Fool. I, this is a return now that I'm doing. Uh, in the early 2000s, and I open up the arts and leisure section of The New York Times, Sunday, right? Mm-hmm. And I see above the fold, uh, fairly certain it was the discussion of the installation of the Flavins, which happened late, uh, and thanks to Marianne Sacherbrand uh, in healing a rift that had been there and, and getting Dan Flavin to agree to install what truly are just, oh, magnificent fluorescent light sculptures. Well, and I'm reading this, and this article says things like, well, you know, uh, it's three hours from the airport, and it's in the middle of nowhere, a small town in Texas. And I, I turn to Villas, and I say, have you ever heard of this place? This is totally anal- anomalous. And he goes, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And he knew the whole story. He knew Judd. He knew Marfa, the whole thing. And so we always sort of thought, um, well, you know, if everything all went to hell, we could move to Marfa. You know, hmm. you're probably too young for this, but I think a lot of people have this sense where they say to themselves, you know, to their spouse, couple, partner, whatever, well, you know, dear, if the world comes to an end. We can always block. <laughs> so for us, it was always move to Marfa. Uh-huh. Now, you have to understand, Villas is the, uh, often the more adventurous one, and I have been often the more sort of practical one. So when we decided to leave D.C. and move to Latvia, and the Latvia thing didn't work out because of the Russian mob, which is a whole other story, we ended up in Santa Fe because I turned to Villas and said, well, isn't it that time now? Isn't it the, well, if everything goes to hell, we can move to Marfa? Remember, I'm the practical one. He turns to me and he said, we can't move to Marfa. We've never been. <laughs> so we got to Santa Fe. You we called his bluff. Yeah, totally. We got to Santa Fe. We spent a little time. We came and visited, and we moved here almost immediately. So I see. Is he an artist, by the way? Villas is a terrific artist, an extremely modest one. He has a great deal of conflict over showing any of his work in Marfa because of his role as a gallery director. He feels somehow that he doesn't want to compromise or in any way uh, look like he's trying to play one off on the other. He's extremely... Mm-hmm. See, Minnesotans, he grew up in Minnesota, mm-hmm. they're really... They've got this whole ethical thing going on. They think, you know, this whole Scandinavian socialist thing where they think, you know, their their fairness is really big and correct. Like Prairie Home Companion, I know it. <laughs> it's no joke. It's like Fargo is not a satire. Fargo <laughs> is... A, no, really, Fargo is real, the movie. Uh, and so anyway, um, yes, he is a wonderful artist, but he's he's just not comfortable showing in Marfa because he doesn't want to be seen to in any way be trading on the gallery. Right. Well, what what is this? Is it representational or abstract? No, it's abstract. It, okay, well, that brings me... That was a, an intentional lead-in. I want to ask you about Donald Judd and Flavin, and I'll tell you why. It's not that I'm critical of these guys, which I am a little bit. Uh, I used to be a lot. Now I am just a little bit. But it's because I think that most people in the most people who care about art kind of come from my perspective. Like this is new stuff, and they don't get it, and they want to get it. And um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I feel I represent the majority. Well, actually, I won't leave it at that. I want to say one thing in favor. <laughs> I want to say, no, one thing in I favor think you're of... Very, I think you're very articulate and observant on these things so far. Well, one thing in favor of Donald and Flavin and uh, 
in, Indy or uh, Villa Cindy. Villa, Villa Cindy. Is this? I do think that in spite of my lack of accepting eyes, the most thriving living art in the world right now is abstract art. Meaning, by Bach has great music. It's not living music. There's no one on the street corner coming up with you know new uh, chorals or what have you. Uh, new double choir choral motets, yes. Yes, and their, their psychedelic music in 1967 was living, breathing music. People had new ideas. They argued about yes, it. Yes, I know. I was alive then. You weren't. There yes. you go. <laughs> well, my huge compliment to the abstract art world is that it, that is the only art in the world, I think, right now that has a heartbeat, whether it's in China or the United States or what have you. Nonetheless, that said, when I go into your gallery... What should I look for, or should I just say it's cool, or it's not, and you know, buy something or leave? Or how do you? How do you? Of course, you should buy something. What kind <laughs> of question is that? Uh-huh. Well, go ahead. Well, the the thing that Villas and I both feel, um, and it's funny how you end up with people that you have that you end up sharing a certain aesthetic without even knowing it. Uh, when we are in a you see, minimalist is such a catch-all for, uh, word, and it can mean so many things. But when we're in a space that you might call minimalist, uh, we feel that a, a lot of people feel it's cold, mm-hmm. and we feel that it's warm. I feel comfortable and warm in a you know with a concrete floor, and you know the concrete boxes yeah. out, out at uh, Chinati make me feel good. Um, and I think that that's what Villas... You see, the, one of the interesting things about Villas was, you know, we didn't move here and say, okay, if we're going to have a gallery, it's going to be minimalist because that's what sells, you know. It was actually because when I met Villas in 1997 and went into his house, uh, Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis, and saw the Bryce Martin and uh, the Joan Mitchell and so on, this was his aesthetic, so he started the gallery with a lot of works that were already in his own collection. Uh, and, and, of course, that really helped because, you know, you got to go out and buy inventory. I mean, it costs a lot of money, and we didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, it's what you see when you go in there are uh, artists who are, you know, dead, uh, minimalists, <laughs> or, or living uh, who... It's very authentic aesthetic for Villas. This is what we feel warm with. This is what we like. Uh, and we would, we would want people who come in to feel that same sense of, um, I mean, I don't want to say comfort. You can't really call it comfort art. But to see something that's really interesting and makes you, makes you, re, you know, interact with it yeah. and have feeling. Have you encountered this... I was maybe I was going to say this difficulty, but maybe it's just a characteristic. Minimalist art doesn't really look good when it's kind of stacked on top of each other, and so you got to right. you 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 either have to have space to show it, or you have to decide on like the ten best things that you're going to show, and you can't really have your gallery. right. It can't be a Victorian attic. Yeah, but so your your, your place, and I'll describe it for folks. Um, it's quiet. There's no music. I don't think you have windows. Am I right? Well, we. It's not done, so we have uh, we have translucent or opaque plastic for the windows, okay. uh, and the interior is kind of a. Uh, I was going to say gunmetal, but it's really bluer to paint than gunmetal. If, for lack of better words, it has kind of a library type of quietude to it, but and an industrial look. A, an industrial look. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, folks. Yeah. Don't don't go there with your books. Uh, but also. <laughs> You're giving, I'm just off the top of my head estimating, like four feet of space to each a piece? Oh, at least. But th- but you have to have that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, listeners really have to understand that one of the things that I think that is fun about this is that, you know, if Villas were answering these questions, he would have very set so, uh, viewpoints and explanations. And I think, in some respects, what's interesting... Uh, <laughs> this sounds hilarious. About me answering this is it's more like what I think someone would feel who comes in. Uh, you know, I think, I understand that it has to be um, spread out. It has to be spare because you have to really give each piece some room. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and part of it is that 
So, so much is subtle. Take the Hadi Tabatabai string uh, pieces. You come up to them, and you, and you know there are dozens and dozens of these strings, um, masterfully placed by hand, one after another after another. And only when you get close, for example, might you notice that they extend briefly on the ends. Mm. You know, they come out, and you just have to—you know—you have to look at things. You have to look closely, and if it's all bunched up together, no one will stop and look. One of the things that I've... I mean, I could be full of shit, no, you know. Well, maybe. You know. Yes, you could. I, but I, <laughs> but I, that's I, how I react, it, it, okay? This is how I see it. Right. Now, if you're full of shit, then you're convincing me a little bit, because what I've got my head around is this idea that there is really no such thing as abstract art. When you go to see... Uh, a bunch of strings, like what they are, are a bunch of strings. If you go to see a bunch of boxes, you know, on the highway, right. what they are are a bunch of boxes. Good work. <laughs> kind of, and uh, in in your in your space over there, you have a lot of different a lot of different themes of stuff. You got the stuff on the floor. You got the stuff that looks like it's right. The the Nelica uh, Be- Belchin sculptures on the floor, which are just wonderful. Well, what tell us about those? I'll start off. They're they're non-platonic solids. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're not straight planes. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, she's from uh, the Netherlands and teaches in Missoula. And Phyllis came across her work. And d- this is another. I mean, how old is she, by the way? She's uh, right up your alley. Okay. Interviews over. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, delightful, mm-hmm. tall and thin, and really just a delight. Has a great flashing smile, sense of humor. Uh, what Villas? It's, it's uh, I, not that I'm going to brag on him too much, but he doesn't. The artists that he decides that he's go, we're going to have in the gallery who are contemporary living producing now. You know, he just sort of is always looking all day long, all the time, on the web, da-da-da. And if he sees something, he likes it. He doesn't care who the person is, what their reputation is, what they've sold, what they haven't sold, what their resume is. He couldn't care less. He sees it. It interests him. Now, you have to understand, that's a tremendous amount of confidence Mm -hmm. to say, okay, I like it. I'm going to show it. I really don't, you know, need somebody else to tell me. Uh, and this is what, for example, with Erica Blumenfeld, a local artist, uh, well, local artist, I mean, she, with a you know, national, international reputation, David Hershey, uh, Eric Tillingast in Northern California, uh, Hadi Tabatabai. Phyllis just looks. In the case of Tabatabai, he just looked, thought it was great stuff. Tabatabai then goes on to win the Pollock Krasner Award for Young Emerging Artist. So you, you had his stuff before he... Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You know, and it's, it's one of the things that amazes me. You know, I'm a word person, mm-hmm. and Villas is a visual person. Though we, we obviously, you know, he's brilliant. He can mm-hmm. write well, too. But he just sees these things and knows and reacts, and that's and his unfailing taste. What happened to the price of that guy's stuff after he won that award? It went up. <laughs> <laughs> so th- that's good for all, everyone involved. Yeah. Well, you know, the typical thing for a, a living artist uh, mm-hmm. who's, who's producing now is that you essentially have the work on consignment, right? Mm-hmm. And the gallery receives, you know, 40 to 50% and the artist receives the rest typically. Mm-hmm. Whereas, of course, for, for other stuff, you know, you have to actually buy it, hold it in inventory, and all the time it's sitting there, it's not earning you any money. That's a business guy talking, yeah, right? Do, do, do you, wait, do you have an inventory? Of yeah, what? of course. We have we have Judds, we have Flavins, we have, uh, works on paper. How, how did you get the Judds? You, just... you buy them. Okay, so most of the... But artists, they're not they're not hundred thousand no, no, no. million dollar originals. They're prints usually. I understand, but yeah. you, most of the stuff you have is stuff that you guys have discovered. Is well, that... we, well, Villas is found online or owned. Yeah, but in the case of Judd, obviously it's... Yeah, well, there's a lot of prints. There are a lot of prints. There's a market for them, right? You yeah. can buy them uh, online. You, you, they come up for auction. Mm-hmm. Villas has a lot of purchasing at auction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing is, of course, with having the, uh, the site on the web, people contact you. You know, they'll say... Like, here was this, this one guy, and he inherited, like, 
several dozen of the Judd Parallelograms, uh, you know, amazing work prints. And he didn't know what to do with them. So he sold some to Villas, you know, and because uh, he saw them online. He saw that we had one. Well, we want some more. <laughs> uh, um, one more question about art, and then I want to talk to you about Marfa. I don't even know if you could answer this, but is it the goal slash dream of an artist to have their stuff out there in the world? Or do you think, from your experience, most artists would rather keep all their stuff in their living room, but they need cash, and so it's got to be sold, and that's how the whole art transaction process begins? Well, of course, I couldn't speak for most artists, but I think that what you want to do is communicate Right. I mean, the, the production of art is to communicate. And I think most people would like that people see what they're doing and appreciate what they're thinking. I mean, you see someone, you see a show at the bookstore and you see you see the the artist interacting with people who are observing and so on. And I would think it'd be very gratifying. I really don't know any people who sit inside their studio and really don't care Oh, I, it's, I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not suggesting they don't care. I'm suggesting they reverse care or upside down. In their minds, they think this guy doesn't know what I'm about. I don't want him to buy my stuff. You know, I don't want this in their living room. They drink a long whiskey or something like that. Well, I think that's fairly immature. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> such is life. Speaking of immature, okay, you've been in Martha since 2005. Five September. Yeah. Now, normally uh, we did these interviews last year. We've done them this year, and I uh, talk to folks older than yourself. And Is I, that possible? I'm fifty. <laughs> I'm fifty-four. Uh, oh, I take it back. Impossible. No, we do. <laughs> and we and I ask him about the change that Marfa has gone through. But 2005. Here's what Marfa has seen. It's uh, seen real estate prices go down. It's seen galleries go out of business. And you're in the gallery business. It's seen Padres emerge and the film festival emerge. And it seems to me, if you wrap all that up, what you have is a package of the town becoming slightly more adolescent, slightly less wealthy. Have you picked up on that, or is that just my imagination? <sighs> wow. Bonk. Can I have another beer, too? Yeah, of course. While you think about the Yeah, uh, 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 I'm going to the refrigerator to get another beer. I, when you left to get a beer, I had asked you... Um, yeah, no, I think it's... No, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, so give me, give me 2005 versus 2010 in your book. Well, from a hard-ass business standpoint... Um, prices did keep rising after we got here. So it's not like, you know, so people who arrived in 2005 still got decent deals on real estate. That's the hard sort of point of view. And some galleries that were already in place and doing well then continue to. I mean, while it's very kind of of your friend to say that we're a serious gallery, and and what I think that means is that Villas takes his work seriously. Villas really loves what he does and believes and he, in it. And he's there. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. No. Of course. I understand. He actually, gives, but I have to say, Dennis Dickinson at Exhibitions Two D. Always there. I mean, yeah, all the time. And uh, apart from being an absolutely wonderful personality. Someone who cares very, very deeply for the work that he shows and for, for the aesthetic and who also will show, you know, give each piece a lot of space, like you're saying. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, I love Dennis. Yeah, really uh, magnificent. And, and the fact that I'm not bringing other people out is not for lack of interest. He just, at that point, mm -hmm. you know, popped up. I, after five years, you know, am just barely beginning to have a, a perception, but I would say that um, it's a place in great change. If, if adolescent means change or development, mm -hmm. the we have a lot more young people now. Yeah. Uh, and you can't have just a place with, you know, older people. I mean, the, the nature of money is that you generally, not always, you generally have more later because of compounding, right? Saving and compounding and increasing earnings. That's just a fact of life. But you can't just have people move to town and buy up, you know, real estate and pay money and, you know, so on. You have to have youth, uh, partly because youth uh, takes risks, uh, tries things, and adds an extraordinary amount to the town. And I would say that the big difference in 2010 is there's just that whatever mixes are more mixed. Mm -hmm. It's no longer... When we moved here, um, 
you've probably heard this a thousand times, but Tim Crowley and his ex-wife were instrumental uh, in investing in the town in 1999, starting in 99, and, and the bookstore, and a lot of stuff that didn't make a whole lot of money. Well, let me stop you there. Yeah, because, sure. Uh, I don't know. Maybe other people don't, too. Tim Crowley is the Crowley Theater? Right. Tim Crowley is the pavilion above the food short? You bet. Um, Tim Crowley is well. That's enough. But yeah, none of which none of which make him any money. Which were all public service. Yeah. Which are all tremendous gifts to the town. Uh, and uh, now, I mean, you know, he's a landowner, and you know, it's good to have development in town. Uh, but Tim, you know, really uh, after Judd, in terms of modern sort of development of Marfa, you know, first there was Judd, mm. then there was Crowley, right, <laughs> and. You know the and and he and Lynn just did extraordinary things. Uh, today, you know Tim and a lot of the people that came with him around him and friends who bought up and so on. You know, it's just getting more diverse, uh, more people, and it's a it's a it's very exciting, really. Why do I not see your Padres? We are very stay-at-home guys. It, I, it is four blocks away. We just, we're just we're not social guys. <laughs> it's true though. Ask anybody. We're not yeah. out. We we're not. We don't go to th- much. We don't. Uh, uh, we really. I'll tell you. I spend all day long reading SEC filings, mm-hmm. uh, looking at financial statements, computing ratios, uh, writing. I read and write all day long, and I'm telling you, at the end of the day. We want to watch Dexter on Netflix. But, but yeah, I do go to Padres. Okay. I would say a couple of times a month. A couple of times now, a month. Now, I realize well, for us that's a lot, but you know, we sure don't go to many other places a couple of times a month. Well, after the glory of this interview starts to seep into your life, starts to permeate your popularity in this town. Oh, one, hope, can, one can only hope. I would hope to see you there a little <laughs> bit more often. I think what David has done is extraordinary. Now, you want to talk about a hard worker. Yeah. David Beebe. Now, and the other thing that David did, you see, this is this post Crowley generation. You know, David comes in, he gets on the city council, he gets involved, he knows people, he becomes involved in the fabric of the town. Uh, Tom Rapp and Toshi Sakihara at uh, Cochineal. Before they opened that restaurant, I mean, they had everybody and his grandmother over for dinner. A billion times, which, by the way, cost them a fortune. Uh, the wine, the so on. I mean, they built goodwill. They, uh, other businesses in town that haven't done as well, uh, and I will certainly not single any out, you know, they, it's a small town. You have to, I'm not saying you have to kiss the ring, but when we moved here, here this was funny. Uh, I called the Chamber of Commerce, and I can't remember why, and I got this wonderful woman, Sandra, and I wish I could remember her last name. She married Phil Weston uh, not long after. Who's a great guy, and uh, she just said to me, Tom, I, you know, I understand you're moving here, and do you, do you, uh, can I give you some advice? And I was able to hear it at that point. I said, sure, we're happy to have some advice. She said, you know, Tom, just take it easy. People here have had just about as much change as they can handle. Let people come to you. I'm not saying, you know, I'm hardly a wallflower, so I don't, I won't claim to have done that. But it was very good advice. No, point taken. But wait, it, is, this, is that your beer? Yeah, yeah I got my beer. <laughs> and you, uh, you write for the Motley Fool. I mean, if, if I go to the site, will I see stuff that you write? Uh, not so much because the product that um, I, how can I say this? I'm the lead advisor, and essentially, I provide. Special situations and opportunistic value uh, investing for these members. So it's not public. It's, you know, you have to pay. You have a, a stock-related job, a, dro- a job related to right. analysis of companies that are not here in Marfa, Texas, and you do it from Marfa, Texas. <laughs> right. How many companies are and here? Right? Does that make it easier, harder, or pros and cons on that? What do you think? Well, I like not being in a, in New York or L.A. or something because there's a a huge amount of confirmation bias that goes on among money managers. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, with the internet, you know you can pretty much see 
and read what people are thinking about yeah. all the time. I mean, there's really no such thing as an original investment idea anymore because everything's out there. What's original is what you choose. It's, it's not a mass, what I do is not mass market. And part of that, of course, is because it's very contrarian. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for people. To, well, you know, value, value doesn't sell. Value is... No. But now, it's so interesting to me that the two things you are involved in, stocks and art, are, in my estimation, the two, except for possibly bad food, the, the two most prone elements to confirmation bias totally. there are. Absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, it's certainly the case for, for investing. However, I must say, research shows that there are two ways to make money in the stock market uh, consistently over time. And, of course, everyone has sold growth. And, mm -hmm. of course, growth is not one of them. Mm -hmm. The two are momentum and value. And the whole momentum idea is to do what everybody else is doing, just like you said, confirmation bias. The problem with, with that is that no one knows when the momentum will turn. Mm -hmm. And when it turns, you're screwed. And it, uh, I don't know if statistics back me up, but my observation is when it turns, it turns severely. Oh, terribly. And you, so the idea about momentum is that in the short term, the market keeps doing whatever it did. But nobody knows how short that is. Mm -hmm. And when you're wiped out, you're wiped out. The thing about value, which basically means uh, buying assets for less than they could be sold, mm -hmm. which, of course, is a can of worms. Bar bargain hunting. Yeah. It's a, but, you know, one man's right. bargain is another man's sure. whatever. Uh, and that's why we don't all agree on, on something. But the... Uh, that's what's been shown to really withstand. And, and, and in the popular mind, that's associated with Warren Buffett, uh, of course, and his teacher, Ben Graham. Well, let's bring it home, Tom. Uh, would you invest in Marfa right now, 2010? Uh, well, but you see, I am invested in Marfa. So you're putting your money where your mouth is. Oh, well, your we... Mouth where your money we, is. We are... Our net worth is 90% invested in Marfa real well, estate. I'm, so, I'm really happy to hear you say that because, um, you know, you keep talking about my age, but I think I'm taking the biggest risk, the, or it should no, not the biggest risk, my last risk, because after this I can't afford to lose it all, but I'm, I'm really, like, uh, <laughs> drawing the water out of the bucket to buy a house here. It's uh, up by Coalfield Park. That's, yeah, that's up near us. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm buying the, a lot in that neighborhood, knock on glass or whatever. Government laminate imitation wood, yeah. wood plastic. And then I'm going to have to build the place, and then, you know, that, that'll be hopefully the, the last time I have to, like, risk it all. It well, seems well, like... You're, like, you're about 30, right? 29, something like that? 45. You are not 45. I am. 44. October 45. <clears throat> Let the record show. Let the record show. <clears throat> Well, all right. You look much younger. But I, I, I you, are you really 45? Mm -hmm. I'm 54. Look at us. You are, oh, my well, God. Well, anyway, um, let me just tell you something. You got more hair. <laughs> uh, yours is darker. Uh, <laughs> let me just tell you this. Okay. When I was 44, which is a year <laughs> younger than you, I had a legal career as a government lawyer. Yeah, it wasn't a partner in some Wall Street firm, but I had a very good income. I loved my job. I represented uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, so enrolled members of tribes. I U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I had great jobs. I worked with all women, all women lawyers in the office. They were. It was absolutely wonderful atmosphere. And uh, one day, Villas just said to me, you spend all your time on that Motley Fool site. Why don't you apply for a job? And I was like, Villas, what about my retirement? You know, I have, what about security? And Villas has always been about the view that life is an adventure. Now we don't have kids, you yeah. know, and so on and so forth. And his views will always have a roof over our head. We'll always have food. And this is what I say to you. Uh, that turned out very well for me. I mean, you know, the number of years I was starting my own business, didn't make any money, you know, and the, the returns are not in by any stretch of, of the imagination. But, I, but life is not a trial run, and you should make this investment. You should try this. Don't expect that, you know, this real estate investment is going to suddenly be worth a million dollars. But try stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, you're never, you're, you're always going to be able to feed, clothe, and house yourself. 
So, you know, you say, how do I feel about that? I think there's enormous opportunity here. I, th here. I think it's because people like you come and make it what it is. Look, you're, there are going to be people here you're not going to get along with. Already, yes. No, no. And, and it's true for me. Here, look, if you get along with everybody, you're not a person. Uh -huh. you're, a, <laughs> you're a nothing. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, you know enough not to come in like you're in, you know, walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, you know, or right. something. Well, I, I hope it works, and it'll be nice to be your neighbor. Uh, and if I'm laid off, I'll be uh, selling art in your gallery, no doubt. 